We are minutes away from the launch of NASA's Lucy mission to the never-before-explored Trojan asteroids. Lucy's long journey to space begins today, but her story actually started years ago. It took a team of scientists and engineers many years to plan where Lucy would go and what she would have to do. Then, Lucy's engineers had to build her out of individual parts and put her together like a puzzle. Lucy had to go through tough physical tests to prove she was mission ready. How are you holding up, Lucy? These are the vibration and acoustic tests to make sure that Lucy won't lose any screws during the shaky launch on a rocket. Lucy wasn't quite ready just yet. The engineers still had to be sure that she was prepared for the harsh environment of space. They chilled Lucy to freezing temperatures, then warmed her up to scalding hot temperatures in the thermal vacuum test. Sure, those tests weren't easy, but they prepared Lucy for the long adventure ahead. We're glad you can join Lucy on her adventure to explore the Trojan asteroids. Now, let's get the journey started. I'm Noah Petro, the project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a spacecraft that has been orbiting the moon for over a decade, paving the way for humans to return to the surface. As a scientist, I get excited about the amount of data that we've been able to collect on the moon. We now know more about its geological history, its chemistry and topography than ever before. But to me, the data also shows something beyond the science we've investigated, its beauty. The visualizations you're about to see not only hold important scientific value, but artistic value as well. These moonscapes have a fascinating story to tell, and I hope it's one that you enjoy. The moon is our nearest neighbor, our nightlight. It's also our memory. While wind, water, and molten rock erase Earth's deep history, the moon remembers everything that has happened in the last four and a half billion years. The impact that formed the Oriental Basin provides a window to understanding how similar large events on other planets and moons have shaped their landscapes. The discovery of water on the sunlit surface of Clavius Crater not only unlocks new possibilities for future lunar exploration, but also our understanding of where the ingredients of life could exist in our vast universe. The steep trenches and cracked surface of Komarov Crater on the far side tell a story of the ancient volcanic activity from the moon's interior, revealing the history of geologic forces carving the lunar terrain through time.
Traversing the landscape, we can see a beautiful tapestry of ridges, valleys, and mountains, best encapsulated by the view of Tycho Crater. The summit of its central peak stands nearly three miles above the crater floor, a visual metaphor for the steep challenges but exciting rewards that await us on the moon and beyond. And on the lunar horizon, the most consequential view of all, our home. To study the moon is to study ourselves, our past, our present, and our future. Each new discovery bringing us from darkness into light. The gravitational forces between Earth and Moon make our very existence possible, creating one of the most special relationships throughout time and space. There are a few ways to think about the edge of the solar system. One is with the extent of the solar wind. This is the constant flow of charged particles gushing out of the sun at a million miles per hour and bathing the planets. The wind forms a giant protective bubble around our solar system, known as the heliosphere. This huge region surfs through the Milky Way, shielding us from interstellar radiation and creating an environment that helps life on Earth to flourish. But its borders aren't fixed. Around 11 billion miles from Earth, far past the planets, solar wind pushes against interstellar space. Scientists have been monitoring this boundary over the past decade, and they're seeing it change with the sun's activity. Roughly every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field ramps up. This is known as the solar cycle, and at the peak, the sun's magnetic poles flip, north becomes south, and vice versa. This cycle causes the sun's activity to sway from calm to turbulent with an abundance of flares and eruptions, which in turn affects the solar wind. Changes from the sun can make the solar wind gust hard. When it does, the heliosphere expands like a balloon. Over the past solar cycle, scientists mapped what that looked like. To understand these maps, you need to know how we observe the edge of the solar system. Scientists use NASA's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX, about the size of a bus tire and in the orbit around Earth. IBEX maps the heliosphere with a process similar to sonar. But instead of using sound to detect objects, it uses the echo of solar wind variations. For example, starting in 2014, there was a huge and prolonged increase in solar wind pressure. NASA spacecraft near Earth detected solar wind gusting 50% harder than previous years. After traveling outward for a year, solar wind hit the edge of the heliosphere. First, the termination shock, and then it entered the heliosheath that's encased by the heliopause. Solar wind particles spent another year or so in this region. Some collided with interstellar gases in the heliosheath and turned into energetic neutral atoms, or ENAs. ENAs travel in all directions, some even back toward Earth. And between 2017 and 2019, a few of the returning ENAs reached IBEX, an echo of where the boundary is and what it looks like. If you cut the heliosphere and laid it out onto a flat surface, this is what you would see. This is the nose and this is the tail. The nose shows high ENA fluxes, which indicate a strong gust of wind and the heliosphere ballooning. From tracking this expansion, scientists found that the nose and tail were not symmetrical. If we compare the maps, ENAs from that big 2014 solar wind increase have returned from the nose, but they haven't returned from the tail yet, suggesting that the tail is much farther away from the sun than the nose. This indicates that the heliosphere looks more like a comet rather than a round bubble. Having a full solar cycle of observations of the heliosphere opens doors to understanding the only environment we so far know can support life. And there have been a few surprises. Beyond the heliosphere, near the nose, there was one region that took two years longer to respond to the 2014 increase of solar wind. Scientists think these ENAs bounced out of the heliopause and into interstellar space before heading back toward Earth. These are signs that we're still learning about the quirks of our heliosphere. 
But one thing's for sure, these characteristics could tell us about the key ingredients for life around a star. It's really an amazing little critter, and it's, it's been around for over three billion years. In 2016, Utah Lake exploded and cyanobacteria blooms. The problem is that many cyanobacteria produce toxins. You may have heard it called blue-green algae, but it's really a kind of bacteria taking in sunlight to drive photosynthesis and giving off oxygen. It actually requires quite a bit of lab testing to know whether or not it's a harmful algal bloom. And what we're really worried about is people and pets ingesting that cyanobacteria. Dr. Kate Fickus is a harmful algal bloom scientist at Utah State University. She helps the Utah Department of Environmental Quality track conditions in lakes and reservoirs. So Utah is the second driest state of the nation. Most of our major lakes are actually man-made reservoirs. Um, they're heavily used for recreation. They're heavily used for agriculture. Um, and they're really important to the state as a resource. In 2017, harmful algal blooms returned to Utah Lake. This time, officials used satellite data to identify troubled locations. But how can instruments up in space tell us about microscopic organisms in a lake down on Earth? By measuring their blue-green color. Landsat collects light in visible and infrared wavelengths. Cyanobacteria reflect more green light than plain water does, allowing Landsat to identify algal blooms. From satellite, what we see is uh, basically uh, that primary pigment, which is chlorophyll A, but the color by itself could be misleading. A nice picture is not necessarily providing a set of quantitative uh, data. Algal blooms can look beautiful from space, but the numbers behind the images are the important part. Each measurement is, is highly accurate and it's very, it's very much corresponding to the number of photons that are leaving the body of water, which could be related to the biomass and the amount of phytoplankton. 
Dr. Nima Palavan is working with NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey to make sure Landsat users have consistent, accurate, and ready-to-use data about lakes and rivers. Water is difficult to study from space, because only a fraction of the sunlight is reflected back to the satellite. But engineering improvements on Landsat 8 have leveled up its ability to measure the small signals from water bodies. After Landsat collects the data, it gets beamed down to the USGS Eros Center, where it is archived. The raw numbers pass through checkpoints to align the geography, correct for sun strength, and then compensate for the effects of the atmosphere. So you're essentially removing those uh, atmospheric scattering and absorption. Let's break down what NEMA means here. To measure the amount of cyanobacteria, you need to know how much light reflected off the surface. But some of that light gets scattered by molecules in the atmosphere on the way to the satellite, lessening the signal received. And sometimes light that never made it to the surface gets scattered into the satellite, adding a false signal. Like removing the haze from a photograph, atmospheric corrections leave you with a quantitative measurement of exactly how much light left the water, known as aquatic reflectance. You want to look at the actual uh, physical measurements to derive physically meaningful products from satellite data. And that's the goal, to transform the raw materials into finished products so that end users don't have to build it themselves. By providing aquatic reflectance products, you're uh, reducing, majorly reducing the burden on uh, satellite users. Although it is still provisional, NEMA's aquatic reflectance data product is available for download from the USGS. Scientists like Kate Fickus convert the data product to maps showing the amount of chlorophyll A, helping local officials pinpoint where to test for toxins and warn residents. I use Landsat and other remote sensing technology to help local health departments understand where there's a bloom, the magnitude of the bloom, and the size of the bloom. The spatial detail is another benefit of using Landsat data. Each pixel is only a 30 meter square, the size of a baseball diamond. Yet it collects data across a broad area. In other words, there is a lot of data at a fairly high resolution. With Landsat, we can get into some of the marinas that are popular fishing and swimming spots in order to inform local health departments about making public health decisions. For the 2017 outbreak, that's exactly what happened. Satellite data gave an early warning to local officials in Utah. The extra week of warning saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in healthcare costs. Monitoring algal blooms from aquatic reflectance data is just one example of benefits from Landsat's data products. Wildfires, snow cover, vegetation health, temperature, and more are available for every spot on Earth. Landsat's highly calibrated data products, free to download and use, are making detailed Earth observation data more accessible to users and bringing a greater benefit to society. There is evidence that a planet around a distant star lost its atmosphere, then gained a second one through volcanic activity, according to scientists using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. The planet, GJ 1132b is hypothesized to have begun as a gaseous world with a rocky core. Starting out at several times the diameter of Earth, this so-called sub-Neptune quickly lost its early hydrogen and helium atmosphere due to the intense radiation of the young hot star it orbits. Then, the planet was stripped down to a bare core about the size of Earth. And that's when things got interesting. To the surprise of astronomers, Hubble observed an atmosphere which, according to their theory, is a secondary atmosphere that is present now. Based on a combination of direct observational evidence and inference through computer modeling, the team reports that the atmosphere consists of molecular hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, and methane, and also contains an aerosol haze. Scientists think hydrogen from the original atmosphere was absorbed into the planet's molten magma mantle, then slowly released through volcanic processes to form a new atmosphere. Though this hydrogen continues to escape into space, the secondary atmosphere is replenished by volcanic gases that seep through cracks in the planet's thin crust. 
Scientists are wondering how many other planets might have started out as gas giants but became smaller and rocky after their early atmospheres evaporated away. Astronomers hope to use the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope's infrared vision to detect hot areas of volcanic activity on the planet. GJ 1132b might be orbiting a distant star 41 light years away, but thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, it just got a little bit closer. Carbon dioxide is a kind of plant food. Plants break down carbon dioxide as they make energy through photosynthesis, releasing oxygen in the process. That's why, as humans have increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, some places have seen increased plant growth. But that won't continue forever. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, responsible for warming our planet. Right now, the land and the ocean absorb about 55% of the carbon dioxide released by humans. The rest stays in the atmosphere, acting like a blanket around Earth. As the climate gets warmer, plants are absorbing less carbon dioxide. In some places, like the Arctic region, water is becoming scarcer, acting as a limiting factor that inhibits plant growth. In other places, like the tropical latitudes, low soil nutrients limit the growth of plants, even when there's plenty of carbon dioxide. But it's not just external factors that could affect how plants absorb carbon dioxide. As the concentration in the atmosphere increases, plants seem to use less of it. From 1982 to 2015, we've already seen a decrease in how efficient plants are at absorbing carbon dioxide. NASA researchers are using data from a variety of different satellites to calculate how efficient plants are at absorbing carbon dioxide. They're working to understand how more carbon emissions will warm the planet as plants use less of it. Important for understanding how hot Earth will get. There's a rhythm emanating from the sun to the edges of the solar system. Roughly every 11 years, our star ramps up to a turbulent state, expelling violent eruptions. After a peak, it calms down to a quieter phase before starting all over again. This is known as the solar cycle. This ebb and flow of solar activity affects the entire solar system, including spacecraft electronics and astronauts that can be affected by particle radiation if they're not sufficiently protected. Understanding the solar cycle is one of the oldest problems in solar physics, and now predicting it is more critical than ever as we venture to the Moon, Mars and beyond. So here are ways we've learned about tracking it. So welcome to the dome. Today we're going to observe the sun and see if it has some sunspots. Every morning when the skies are clear, Olivier looks through this telescope in search of sunspots. These are dark blotches on the sun that are the main source of solar eruptions. They appear and disappear on the sun's surface. So we're not looking at the sun. In fact, we're looking at the shadow of the instrument. Then we put the paper always at the same place. And then we can start drawing. Olivier and a team of sun observers record the pattern of sunspots by pencil. The first known record of sunspots date back to around a thousand years ago in China. After the invention of the telescope in the 17th century, routine observations were made. Today, sunspot drawers still use the same technique. While we've created satellites that can see the sun in much more detail in recent decades, drawing by hand keeps the centuries-long record consistent. The sunspot number record goes back farther than any other instrument allowing scientists to analyze the sun's behavior over many, many solar cycles. Sunspot numbers are collected from observatories around the world and are averaged. During every 11-year cycle, the number of sunspots rise from zero to a peak and then go back down to zero again. Scientists use these numbers to determine when a new solar cycle begins and how active a cycle is. Solar maximum, the period of highest activity, can vary wildly from cycle to cycle. The more sunspots there are, the higher the frequency of solar storms of all types. Some that create aurora, and some that can affect power grids on Earth. 
But sunspot number isn't the only indicator we see. These numbers are often combined with other signs. At the beginning of each cycle, sunspots appear on the sun in the mid-latitudes for a brief few hours to days. At solar minimum, there are often days without any spots at all. As the sun becomes more active, sunspots form closer to the equator and can stick around for weeks to months. These sunspot patterns give clues to what drives the solar cycle, the twisting of the sun's magnetic field. Like Earth, the sun has a magnetic field with a north and south pole. But unlike Earth, the sun's magnetic field becomes extremely complex. This is because the sun is made of plasma, a charged gas that generates electric currents. As the sun rotates, plasma around the equator moves faster than near the poles, causing the magnetic fields to become stretched, elongated, and then twisted. Then kinks in the magnetic fields burst through the surface as sunspots larger than the size of Earth. As the solar cycle unfolds, more sunspots appear and the magnetic field becomes more tangled. At the peak of the solar cycle, the sun's magnetic field flips. The North Pole switches to the South and vice versa. The cycle then ramps down, ready to start a new cycle. Scientists can eventually see the result of this flip inside sunspots using satellites. This black and white image of the sun shows the magnetic field on the surface. Most sunspots appear in pairs. Like a magnet, one side is positive and the other is negative. After they form, they gradually disappear again, leaving behind remnants of magnetic fields that move towards the sun's poles. Eventually, each pole accumulates enough magnetic fields, forcing the sun's poles to flip at the peak of the cycle. Then, new sunspot groups appear with the polarities in the opposite direction. Scientists look for a consistent string of these new sunspots in order to declare the next solar cycle. But the transition between cycles is slow and messy. Cycles often overlap, creating freckles of old and new sunspots on the sun at the same time. Scientists can only determine we're in the new cycle when the number of new sunspots overtake old ones, which can be six months to a year after the new cycle has begun. While these spots give us a visible tracker, in recent years, scientists have discovered another signal that's hard to see from Earth. The strength of the sun's poles during solar minimum can help predict how active the next cycle will be. After the poles have reversed at the peak, scientists keep a close eye on it for the next few years. If the magnetic fields accumulated at the poles become strong during this time, it's likely the next solar cycle will be an active one. If the buildup is weak, the next solar cycle won't be as active. While we use these indicators to track the sun, predictions are still hard. After all, we've only had detailed satellite observations of the last four solar cycles, and scientists are still learning about what causes the sun cycle. So until we piece together those missing pieces, the sun, even with its 11-year clock, will continue to surprise us. Five years ago, a NASA-funded science team ventured onto an ever-changing region of the Greenland ice sheet in the peak of summer melt season, when the ice was literally melting out from under their feet. What they learned is changing the way we think about the movement of ice sheets, and possibly changing our computer models that predict how fast ice will melt, a question which matters to every coastline on the planet. The number one reason we are here is all about global sea level rise. Greenland is the single largest melting chunk of ice in the world. What really matters to the world is how much of that water melted on the ice sheet gets out to the ocean. In order to collect this data, the team had to first transport scientific equipment and survival gear to Greenland, and then travel via helicopter to set up camp in the Ablation Zone, a region of melting ice. Camping out here logistically is very difficult. We're camping in the Ablation Zone. It's very wet, as you can see. The Ablation Zone is where it is melting over the summer. Even talking to the logistics coordinators, they're very interested in our camp because they're trying to learn things about how do you camp in the Ablation Zone. One lesson is to be quick and nimble. The team had to evacuate from the first spot they scouted 
because the surface started melting right under their camp. So what big science questions are at the heart of this bold undertaking? In 2015, when we started this study, there was surprisingly little attention paid to the hydrology of streams and rivers on the ice sheet, especially inland away from the ice edge. And we felt that this was a critical scientific gap. Just from looking at satellite images of the ice sheet, it was very apparent that very large volumes of meltwater were moving through these systems. And one of the things we learned uh, is that the total volume of water passing through these river systems far exceeds the volume of water contained by lakes. Much like the terrestrial land surface, you know, lakes catch your eye because they're so big, but the real action, the real flux is through the rivers. All of these rivers terminate in a stunning and dangerous feature called a moulin, which is a essentially a sinkhole in the glacier surface that develops when these large rivers melt down into the ice to a point where they encounter uh, a crack of some type. At that point, the river is captured and it ceases to flow over the surface of the ice sheet and instead plummets down into the interior. And this year, we mapped 538 of these very large blue rivers and showed that every single one of them terminates in one of these moulins. So water that's melted on top of the ice sheet is quickly and effectively gathered and transferred through these branching stream and river network systems. They are swept off the surface of the sheet within a matter of a few hours or even less and ultimately emerge 80 kilometers from here at the ice edge.
provides a beautiful shot. What makes data visualization a bit different from other types of animation is that some component of the visual, some aspect of the visual is directly based on some type of science data. So in the case of the tour of asteroid Bennu, the OSIRIS-REx trajectory is actually based on mission data. The model itself, the asteroid model, that is real LIDAR data that was collected from the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. The imagery that you're seeing wrapped to the surface of Bennu, that is actual satellite imagery taken by the spacecraft. And so that's kind of the difference between visualization and animation, is we're showing the real data. This is the real asteroid. So if we zoom all the way in on a boulder, that's the real boulder. That's, that's what it looked like from the perspective of the spacecraft. I'm Kel Elkins, and I was the lead data visualizer on the tour of asteroid Bennu. I'm Dan Gallagher. I was the producer and writer on the tour of asteroid Bennu. Tour of Asteroid Bennu was inspired by an earlier video that was also made by NASA Scientific Visualization Studio, and that video was called Tour of the Moon. The visualizer, Ernie Wright, used elevation data and high-resolution imagery from a NASA spacecraft called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and he was able to fly the camera very close to the lunar surface and show the actual textures, uh, shadows, highlights, just the way that they would appear if you were hovering close to the surface of the moon. So we kind of borrowed some of those techniques for the tour of asteroid Bennu, really using lighting as a way to help viewers understand the shape of Bennu and the shape of, of, of these different geological features we were zooming in on, which, which just it really helped the visualization come to life. So a good example of how we use LIDAR comes about halfway through the video when we take viewers to a boulder called the gargoyle. Now the gargoyle has a very complex amorphous shape and it looks really different uh, when you see it from different angles in two-dimensional photographs. But when we finally got a good 3D model of the gargoyle, Kel was able to put a virtual camera down near the surface of Bennu and rotate it around the boulder in a way that we never could with two-dimensional imagery. So something really cool about working on this particular visualization, and actually all the visualizations we made for the OSIRIS-REx mission, was as the spacecraft got closer and closer to the asteroid on its way there, and as it spent more time studying the asteroid, the models got better and better. The data that was collected was getting better and better. So some of our early visualization tests, we had this relatively low poly model of the asteroid, and we could only push in so far with the camera. You can't push in too far because then you just see you know, individual polygons. But as we got further and further along, we ended up with five centimeter resolution tiles that you could push all the way into individual boulders. And that's just the nature of how these science missions work. The more time you spend with something, the more data collect, uh, the better the models get. Missions like OSIRIS-REx take us to places that we haven't been before, literally new worlds that we've never experienced but they show us those places in ways that can't always be easily seen. Tour of Asteroid Bennu gives us a way not only to show the public what these places are like, but it almost gives us a remote presence. It allows viewers and even scientists on the mission to see these objects up close through technology. So you're looking to find, and watch, some black holes. And there are quite a few of them, so you're in for a treat. But before you get to all the fancy ones, let's first take a look at some of the simplest ones. After all, looking at the fancy ones first would be like trying to spot a Zordorgian Grandelbus before you even know basic Grandelbus anatomy, and that would just be silly. Anyway, your basic solitary black hole is, well, basic, uh, relatively speaking. It has a lot of mass, a bit of spin, a boundary inside of which everything, including light, can only fall inward. And beyond that, well, we actually have no idea. However, because solitary black holes are so simple, they're quite hard to spot. But if you have a keen eye, you might be able to catch a glimpse of them by looking at their surroundings. For example, black holes bend the light traveling past them, and you can see this effect, called lensing, around the edge of the black hole. There you are! Also, because black holes tend to mess with their environments, you can sometimes find one by using other clues, such as a bunch of stuff orbiting what appears to be nothing. Anyway, now that you know a bit more, grab your telescopes and enjoy. An unusual eruption on the sun may offer clues to understanding our star's mysterious explosions. Solar eruptions are massive releases of material off the surface of the Sun. 
This material can travel across the solar system to Earth and Mars. The radiation and the material from the sun can interact with the planet's magnetic fields, affecting astronauts and technology. Eruptions on the sun usually come in one of three forms. Coronal mass ejections, jets, and partial eruptions. The new research studied an event named the Rosetta Stone of solar eruptions. Just as the Rosetta Stone was the key to understanding Egyptian hieroglyphics, studying this eruption could be the key to understanding all types of solar eruptions. In the Rosetta Stone eruption, all three types of eruptions happened in the same event. They usually occur separately. The main eruption was too big to be a jet, but too narrow to be a coronal mass ejection. A second cooler layer of material on the surface of the sun also started to erupt about a half an hour later. But it fell back down as a partial solar eruption. This Rosetta Stone of solar eruptions will also give clues to help scientists predict large eruptions in the future. The better our predictions are, the more time we have to prepare for material from the sun to interact with Earth's magnetic field. Predicting large solar eruptions can help better protect our astronauts and technology, near Earth and beyond. Good morning. So it's the 22nd of March, 2021. It's 4.50 in the morning. We are here this early to load the Spex-1 instrument into the truck. Uh, SPEX-1 will measure the intensity and degree of polarization of light that is reflected by small particles in the atmosphere. These particles are called aerosols. So overall, aerosols uh, counterbalance the warming by greenhouse gases, but we don't know by what amount. And because this is so unknown, uh, it's hard to predict future climate change. And with SPEX-1, we want to accurately measure the effect of aerosols on clouds and climate. One challenge in building and designing SPEX-1 was the design of the optical system. Since SPEX-1 is a multi-viewing instrument, we needed to be able to capture the light from five different directions into a single compact instrument.
the blue marble. That was our first view of ourselves. We really are the blue planet. We're hanging out here in the middle of nowhere. In fact, Apollo imagery was part of the justification for putting together a satellite that would look at the Earth. That satellite was the first Landsat. The Landsat mission now holds the title for the longest continuous space-based record of Earth's land in existence. At least one Landsat satellite has been orbiting the Earth since 1972. That's nearly 50 years of steadfast observation. The program was born in the midst of several historical flashpoints during a time when the world was changing quickly. Well, it really was a perfect storm. We had a lot of technology coming out of World War II with air-flown sensors. We also had an awareness of the environment between Rachel Carson. Even Stuart Udall wrote a book called The Quiet Crisis. Those two things together, the space race, all of those came together. But the Landsat story doesn't actually start with NASA. It starts with the United States Geological Survey. There were a couple of really interesting players. The primary one is William T. Pecora, and he was director of the U.S. Geological Survey. His boss was Stuart Udall. He tried floating it around, and it didn't quite make it. Department of Defense, the CIA, NASA, which was just beginning at that point, they all said, nah, you know, this isn't the right time. So in 1966, Pakora and Udall announced that, okay, fine, Department of Interior will, will launch. And so that caused a big kerfuffle. And, and the bottom line was that NASA was forced to step up and say, yeah, okay, we'll do it. But let's pause for a second. Obviously, there was a big push to make an Earth-observing satellite. But what exactly did it need to do? Landsat's entire job is to collect light, visible light like this, and non-visible light like this. After Landsat captures the light it sees, it can make two kinds of pictures, true color images and false color images. Did you know your eyes can only detect red, green, and blue? It sounds crazy, but it's true. In fact, if you took a magnifying glass to the screen you're probably looking at right now, you'd see a jumble of red, green, and blue dots. Mix those colors together with different intensities, and your brain interprets all the colors of the rainbow. True color images are made by combining red, blue, and green light. But what's even more amazing? Landsat also captures infrared light beyond what we can see. And that light can reveal some incredible things when you look at a false color image. Like the difference between types of plants, how healthy those plants are, healthy coral reefs and even dead coral reefs, fire tracking, ocean pollution, the possibilities are nearly endless. In fact, I bet you've probably seen Landsat's influence on pop culture without even knowing it. From Google Earth and works of art, to television and movies. And I should know, before my untimely smushing by an 85-foot tall great ape deep into the film, I, your narrator, played Landsat Steve in Kong Skull Island. But I digress. Now, back to our story. NASA and USGS get to work, largely under the direction of lead engineer Virginia Norwood, who was often called the mother of Landsat. Norwood and her team had to design an experimental instrument, the multispectral scanner, that had never been flown in space before. We took a, uh, and NASA took a real gamble to propose a scanner for this, met with quite a bit of skepticism. To assuage the skeptics and test the scanner's capabilities, the team loaded up the test model on a truck and headed to Yosemite. And this was because nobody believes that scanner will work. I think you better, you better give us some assurance. The true test came when Landsat 1 launched on July 23, 1972. Sadly, William T. Pecora, one of the project's original champions, died just three days before Landsat took its place in orbit. But with this launch, the United States and soon the world would step into a new paradigm of Earth observation. Never before seen snapshot of land resources in the environment would be key for critical decision making decades into the future.
As we started to approach Bennu from a distance and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought it would, with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. And what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting and what we had designed to. We have never done this before. We're actually gonna collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. After the additional observations of Bennu, we had to down-select to four sites, and then go back and survey those sites even further to select the final primary sample site. My first impression of Nightingale is that's the last place I wanted to go. But as we started looking at other sites, we saw that one, this is probably one of the most sampleable sites, and two, we were overperforming in our navigation capability and our ability to contact. Natural feature tracking works a lot like the human mind in that we pick up landmarks along the way. As we descend, we look at features on the ground. We program the computer to recognize certain features. It takes a picture, says this feature is not where I expected it to be. It's a little bit off to the side. Updates its position based on where it's pointed and where that feature shows up in the camera position. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag sam, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. But there are several things that could go wrong and we also have to be prepared that we won't be successful on our first try at Nightingale. We don't only get one shot at TAG, we actually have three nitrogen bottles on board the spacecraft so we can potentially do three TAG attempts if needed. We go through several what-if scenarios and this is how we actually prepare for a lot of our contingencies. So we've had to look all around the surface and identify the rocks and boulders that if the spacecraft were to tip over up to 25 degrees, it could come into contact and be damaged. We had to develop a hazard map, which we program into the computer and says, if you're getting too close to those hazards, we'll do a wave off, we'll back away from the asteroid, and we'll come back and do this another day. Everything might work perfectly. We come down, we touch the surface just where we want to, we fire the gas bottle, but the area we contact is covered in large rocks. Those rocks would prevent any fine grain material from being stirred up and captured in the tag sam head. Another similar scenario is if the tag sam were to touch on the edge of a boulder and become tipped up. In that case, when the gas bottle fires, much of that gas escapes out the side, not churning up the material that we want to capture. The day of TAG is gonna be really exciting, but the excitement for our team doesn't end there. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're gonna image the TAG SAM head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're gonna do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. This is the culmination uh, of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. It is really exciting to know that we're finally gonna be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth.